The pre-sale for badges to the Rose City Comic Con is underway. It's coming to the Oregon Convention Center September 6th through 8th, and this year's lineup is stacked. Hayden Christensen, aka Anakin Skywalker, will be there, so will Rosario Dawson from movies like Death Proof, Sin City, and Men in Black 2, and Simon Pegg from Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz. Oh, and they just added Nick Frost. That's right, freaking Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. Plus, a ton of cast members from your favorite shows and movies, along with your favorite comic book artists, authors, and so much, much more. Go buy your badges now at rosecitycomiccon.com. With a completely new city council, a new mayor, and all the changes from our charter reform process coming soon, Portlanders have a rare opportunity right now to push for real progress on some of the biggest challenges facing our city. So today on CityCast Portland, we're continuing our series, breaking down how some of these issues might impact the fall election. And in this episode, we're focusing on housing. Willamette Week reporter Sophie Peel is here to talk about what the future of housing in Portland might look like and which candidates are leading the charge. It's Thursday, September 5th. I'm John Natariani in for Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. So I think it is pretty clear that Portland is in a housing crunch. We've been talking about this for years, and it's kind of impossible to miss the fact that we just need more housing in this city. But, like, specifically, what are the biggest issues, you think, regarding housing here in Portland right now? Yeah, I, like you said, John, I think that the number one issue, and I think everyone is well aware of it because it's sort of been in the public discourse for, I mean— at least since I've been reporting, but um, mm-hmm. we just don't have enough. We just don't have the supply that we need. That applies to all types of housing. That's affordable, that's medium income housing, and it's even high income housing. And uh, yeah, it's it's a problem that is not easily remedied. I mean, it takes a lot of time and money to uh, build new housing. Um, and then if we want to get a little bit more nuanced, there's also affordability problems. I mean, we know you know, part of the reason we have such a high homelessness population is that we don't have enough deeply affordable um, apartments in this city. And so the the problem is multifaceted, but really the the kind of central issue is that there is just simply not enough. Yeah, I mean, and it's not just a city problem. We've seen a lot of attention to this at all levels of government, right? I mean, the governor just pushed through a like $369 million housing bill this year. Even Vice President Kamala Harris is talking about boosting housing production on the presidential campaign trail, you know. She said that she wants to build three million homes across the country in four years, which makes me wonder, like, what can local leaders actually do about this? Like, what levers are there that local government can pull to deal with a housing crisis at a city level? Yeah, you know, there are, I think, a number of strategies, and none of them is, uh, you know, kind of a a bullet solution. I mean, again, this is sort of a a piecemeal issue that we are going to have to fix over the span of decades. But there are certain levers that can be pulled. And we have seen in in various governments, both locally and the state as well, pulling some of those levers. So if we look at, uh, you know, I think one of the most kind of obvious things that local government has done is they've passed housing bonds. Mm -hmm. So the regional government, Metro, passed a housing bond in 2018. The city of Portland the year prior also passed a housing bond. Um, and that is basically taxpayer dollars that are used to to build almost all affordable housing. Mm-hmm. Um, there are other kind of more more subtle things. You know, we know that in Portland, and, and I think this, this is true for a lot of big and small cities across the nation, is that we have really restrictive zoning codes. And so one way to spur development is to kind of ease those zoning rules. So in places of, in the city where we normally say you can only build commercial buildings, or you can only build office buildings, uh, we can, you know, kind of scrap those zoning codes and say, okay, you can actually build housing here as well. Mm -hmm. We can also waive various building fees. We can waive taxes, you know, property taxes for a time. Uh, We can uh, not require that uh, housing developers who build especially affordable housing have to pay 
uh, system development charges, which are basically charges for development that go to city <laughs> services. Sophie, I, I'm not going to take the listeners down this rabbit hole, but like, just so you know, I love systems development charges. I think it is so <laughs> interesting <laughs> because it's basically like we need to pay for a sewer. <laughs> If you build a house, there needs to be a sewer and someone needs to pay for it. <laughs> it's Yes, it's super interesting. System development charges, I feel like because it sounds like such a boring term, people sort of like their eyes glaze over. But it's actually yeah. like a very interesting thing that does a lot for our city. It, it generates a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of ways that city leaders can sort of tweak their existing code and ease sort of regulatory you know, burdens and also fees in order to spur housing. And we have seen a fair amount of that the past couple of years. Um, from the Portland City Council. But, you know, all in all, it's 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 probably not enough. I mean, it, it's going to take a lot to really build what we need. Yeah, I mean, there was like a pretty massive change in regards to single family homes, right? To allow more like duplexes and triplexes and yada yada on lots. There was like a big change within the last five years to allow more of that, right? Right. And basically the the concept of that is density. I mean, we mm -hmm. want to replace it, you know, America, Americans are Americans. We like things to be big and illustrious and we take up too much space. And yeah, there's, there's obviously been uh, pushes in recent years to basically increase the city's um, density of housing. So where one single family home went, we can now have six units instead of that. Mm -hmm. Another one is uh, office to residential conversions. What I will say, about that is th the city passed a sort of a package of incentives a couple years ago to try to foster those conversions. Mm -hmm. um, and developers just kept telling the city, this is not penciling out. In a lot of cases, it would actually be more cost efficient to just tear the whole build, the existing office building down and build a new than it would be to convert. And especially for office buildings that are more modern, I mean, the floor plans are expansive. You know, they are just not set up to easily convert to apartments. So that has proved a lot more difficult than I think anyone thought. I think we were a little starry-eyed about that a couple years ago. Yeah. I mean, we know that there's a big problem here, but I think it's pretty clear also that it's hard to fix. Like, what types of things are candidates proposing to address the housing crisis? Like, what are they talking about? I would say from from what I've observed, and we have more than, I think, 80 candidates who um, reached the filing deadline, so who are running. So yeah. uh, I, I can't speak for all 80, <laughs> um, but sort of <laughs> the, the ones, they, yeah, yeah, like, don't do that. That would take hours. <laughs> the ones that I, I would say are sort of the front runners, it seems to be sort of two schools of thought when it comes to uh, really building more, especially affordable housing. I would say the more moderate candidates are really pressing on how to sort of ease property taxes for developers, really trying to figure out how to bring out of state uh, development money back into Portland. Mm -hmm. That ethos is sort of more about if we clean up our city, we can attract developers back to Portland. We want to make it an attractive city, you know, for Texas money, for New York money, for Boston money. And so a lot of those more moderate candidates are talking about easing more of those regulations in order for affordable housing to kind of pencil out for developers. Because I will say affordable housing isn't a very lucrative model. I mean, there's a mm -hmm. reason developers want to create luxury apartments. You get more money. And so it is yeah. hard to be uh, an affordable developer. It's not bringing in the money that like market rate apartments are. The more progressive candidates, a lot of them have sort of brought up, at least to, to us when we've talked to these candidates, this idea of a social housing model. So basically that idea is that the city or the county, but I think for these city council candidates, they're mostly talking about the city, they buy up a bunch of existing apartments or build apartments new and make them deeply affordable. So make them mm -hmm. extremely rent restricted for, I mean, indefinitely. So they would forever be deeply affordable. What I will say about this is that the city does, I mean, a lot of cities do this in in part. I mean, the, the city's housing authority, Home Forward, that's sort of their model is mm -hmm. they create housing, they build housing, or they acquire existing housing and they keep it deeply affordable. So it's not that the city is doing none of that. I think what a lot of these progressive candidates are talking about is doing this sort of in, in like mass amounts of really kind of amassing a bunch of apartments that are deeply affordable. Mm -hmm. I think this is also, I think the premise of social housing it is really an attractive premise, and I think it has the right sort of ethos behind it. But again, it's a lot harder than it sounds, and it's also expensive. I mean, yeah. that's the thing about housing is like it's 
there's no way in which it's not going to be expensive. When we were working on preparing for this conversation, I was like, I remember I read this crazy stat, and it came from one of your articles in April, where you wrote about how some of the apartments that are being built through the Metro housing bond cost between $412,000 and $522,000 per unit in like a large multifamily building that is meant to be affordable housing. And it's like, at those costs, it just seems hard to believe that we could do more of that, right? Yeah. What I will also say about those high costs is I think there's a lot of questions about whether government is striking the right balance between being cost efficient and still, you know, making those units workable and safe. I mean, Mm -hmm. I think there's a question about bloat, whether the city of Portland, whether Metro is using, we we probably shouldn't be using half a million dollars per unit. That just seems Mm -hmm. exorbitant. And I am no expert in, in building, but the people I've talked to, developers I've talked to have said, you don't need to spend half a million dollars on affordable housing per unit. Mm-hmm. What I haven't heard candidates talking about, and I think this is relevant in sort of the current political context, is what I talked about earlier, which is a housing bond. I've heard mm-hmm. very few city city council candidates saying we should bring another housing bond to the ballot. We should ask our taxpayers to open their wallets for another housing bond. I think there's a couple different reasons for that. Because people love paying taxes. Yeah. People are just <laughs> like, I, I think, say that jokingly, but like yeah. Portlanders kind of love paying taxes. Portlanders are kind of like a billion dollars for the school? Sign me yeah. up. <laughs> we have historically, but that sentiment around taxes has really shifted in the past. I would say two to four years. I think Mm -hmm. Portlanders have become much more skeptical about how their tax dollars have been used by the county, by Metro, by the city of Portland. So I don't think we're nearly as tax happy as we used to be. So I think there's a reason city council candidates aren't saying, let's bring another housing bond to the ballot measure. It's because of that. And also late last year, Governor Kotek basically asked cities, don't bring any new taxes. They Or she asked not just cities, local government, don't bring any mm-hmm. new taxes to the ballot because Oregonians are kind of sick of them and they are highly tax burdened. So what seems to be sort of one of the most obvious ways to build more housing, which is more taxpayer dollars, city council candidates aren't really touching. Hmm. Well, let's take a quick break. And then when we come back, we'll get into where the candidates all stand on the housing crisis. Making the right senior living choice is more than just a simple move for your parents. These are long-term care plans. You need solid information and the right person to walk you through each step of the decision-making process. And Lynn Smarges is that person. She's a trusted senior advisor and placement specialist that works tirelessly to ensure your loved ones find the best care tailored to their specific needs and preferences. From independent living and assisted living to memory care, Lynn guides you every step of the way, offering advice, valuable resources, and unwavering support. She researches the retirement communities which best fits your senior family member's circumstances. Not only that, she sets up the appointments to tour these communities and walks her families through each tour advocating for them. You can rely on Lynn to offer your family the care and compassion you need during your senior living journey, because sometimes you just need that extra hand. You can also find out more about everything Lynn has to offer by tuning into her podcast, Caring for Your Aging Parents on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any of your favorite listening platforms. Hi, this is David, the CEO of CityCast. Do you ever find yourself holding back on travel because you're afraid of a language gap? Well, mind the gap no longer as long as you have Babbel. Babbel is the science-backed language learning app. Its 10 minutes lessons are quick and handcrafted to get you talking your new language in three weeks. So I was reminded in the Olympics how much I love French. I had spoken French as a kid, but it has deteriorated to nothing. But I thought I would love to take a trip back to France with my girlfriend, but I'm embarrassed because my French is at zero. And I thought, why don't I get on Babbel and and revive my French? And it's been a joy for the past few weeks. I had I'd forgotten everything. I'd forgotten plurals. I'd forgotten articles, vocabulary. Mostly, I'd just forgotten how to speak and how to listen. And Babbel has me back on track with lots of speaking and lots of listening, because that's how you get better at a language. So I've been working on time, for example. And there's this way in French where when you say 2.45, you don't say 2.45, you say 3 o'clock minus 15. So, je rentre à trois heures moins le quart. 
I'm coming back at 2.45. Anyway, it's so much fun to speak. And don't take my word for it. There's studies from Yale, from Michigan State University that prove that Babbel works. So here's a special limited time deal for CityCast listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash citycast. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash citycast. Spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash citycast. Rules and restrictions may apply. The November 5th election is coming up, and City Club of Portland is here to help you learn about the local candidates and issues. Starting this week, City Club is hosting two free candidate forums, like this Thursday, September 5th, from 5.30 to 7 p.m. at the University Place Hotel and Conference Center. Multnomah County Commission District 1 candidates Megan Moyer and Vadim Mazirsky are sharing their vision for Northwest and Southwest Portland. And on September 9th, from 5.30 to 7 p.m. at the Alberta Rose Theater, Multnomah County Commission District 2 candidates Sam Adams and Shannon Singleton are discussing their plans for North and Northeast Portland. You can register to save a spot and submit questions for the candidates at pdxcityclub.org forward slash 2024. And if you miss it, there'll be recordings and other helpful voter resources at the same site, pdxcityclub.org forward slash 2024. Let's go through a few of the candidates that you have your eye on who are really making housing their priority. Let's start talking about the city council races. Like you said, there's uh, approximately 4,912 candidates for city council. Um, <laughs> yes, that's the number. <laughs> who are a few that have caught your eye that are like saying interesting things about housing? Sure. What, what I'll say about a lot of these city council candidates, and again, I have not spoken to every single one of them, but nearly all of them on their websites and when I've had conversations with them have said, we need more affordable housing. We need to spur affordable housing. I don't think there's any candidate out there that would disagree with that. Everyone agrees on the basic thing of we need more housing and we need to find ways to build more housing. That's yeah. super boilerplate. It's not inventive. Short of going Jimmy Carter and building it themselves, <laughs> right. you need to have some sort of a plan to make it happen. Exactly. And there has been uh, what I have observed as kind of an alarming absence of actual ideas about how to go about that. Because there are mm-hmm. trade-offs and, and these, these are not easy things to do and you're going to have to make kind of politically difficult decisions sometimes in order to do that. So the the two models that I've sort of seen, uh, which I mentioned before, are kind of social housing model and then easing regulatory burdens, waiving property taxes for a time. One of the people that I first heard about the social housing model from was Mitch Green, who is running Mm -hmm. in District 4, which is the West Side District, um, which contains a little sliver of Southeast Portland as well. He's really the first one that I heard about sort of talking about the social housing model. And then some other kind of more progressive candidates have latched on to that idea as well. Um, Mm -hmm. That includes Tiffany uh, Koyama Lane, who is a public school teacher. She's in District 3, which is the inner Southeast District. Then there's sort of a host of candidates that have kind of fallen into the second school of thought, which is maybe not passing more taxes, maybe not the social housing model, because it's a lot harder than we think it is. Let's sort of tweak around the edges. Let's find ways to make this city more attractive to developers and reduce their costs. Mm -hmm. Someone that comes to mind is Olivia Clark, uh, who is running in District 4, again, the West Side District. She was in government for uh, decades, worked under Mm -hmm. former Governor John Kitzhaber, and then worked for TriMet for over 20 years. So many TriMet employees running for office. Yeah, it's so interesting. feels like a very small world looking at all these city council candidates. A lot of them have been in government or are currently in government. Taking a step back, though, talking about like the social housing model, it's interesting looking at the two candidates that you pointed out on their credentials, right? Because Mitch Green has a background as an economist and Tiffany Koyama Lane has a background as a teacher and as an organizer. And it seems like they would be coming to the same idea from like almost like different disciplines and different backgrounds. Totally. They have very, very different backgrounds. But what I will say about both of them is uh, they're both super progressive. And and I think there is a split between a lot of candidates. And I would say this is kind of the progressive moderate split is that a lot of progressive candidates, I think, really frame the homelessness issue as more of an affordable housing 
issue than a drug issue, than a mental mm-hmm. illness issue. Whereas the more moderate candidates, I think, are, are framing the issue more as kind of a law and order issue. Not that they totally, you know, shove the lack of housing to the side, but they're just framing it in a much different way. And they're sort of focusing on different aspects of it. I think some of these moderate candidates even tend to say, like, saying that our homelessness crisis is just a housing crisis is kind of a cop out. You know, it's not just a lack of affordable housing. There's also there's sort of this lawlessness in the city and we don't have enough treatment beds. And so there's kind of these again, I'm thinking of it as sort of these two different schools of thought of like, what is the root of the homelessness crisis and how these city council candidates are sort of the framing the issue as the root of it all is affordable housing problem or the root of it all is kind of government inefficiency and government kind of uh, being too lax about enforcing their rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell me more about the candidates that are all like, we want Texas money. (laughs) We want money from Florida. We want developers. Like, who's in that camp and what are they saying? Sure. Yeah, I I will say that, you know, not each of these people have said we need to get investors from Texas and Florida and all that. We are exaggerating. Yeah. But again, they kind of fall into that, you know, Venn diagram of if we make a Portland a more attractive city, you know, we will bring outside developers here. What I will say is that Portland is not a huge money generator itself. A lot of the reasons why we have a really, well, formerly vibrant downtown, why we have a lot of really swanky office buildings and some really swanky apartment buildings is Mm -hmm. because of -of out-of-state money. Um, It really is. I mean, a lot of our kind of wealth, not that Portland doesn't generate any wealth, of course it does, but a lot of our big money and our big projects are actually because of -of out-of-state money. And Mm -hmm. so that's not an irrelevant thing to talk about. If we stop attracting out-of-state investors, and I think over the past two or three years we have, like our our city will change in certain ways. I would say a couple candidates that uh, sort of fall into that school of thought of Mm -hmm. we can't let Portland languish as like a commerce center. Like we need to keep generating money. I would say Stan Pinkin in District Mm -hmm. 4, longtime kind of neighborhood organizer, I would say Terrence Hayes in District 1, which is the uh, district east of 205. And then once you travel a little bit more south, east of 82nd Avenue, I think there are a bunch of candidates in District 2 that would sort of fall into that school of thought. That includes sitting city commissioner Dan Ryan. In again, back to District 4, there's Tony Morse. uh, There's Eric Zimmerman, who is the um, current chief of staff for Multnomah County Commissioner Julia Broom Edwards. So there's a whole host of these kind of moderate candidates that I think are really focusing on, we need to bring money back to downtown, or at least we can't let what we currently have basically like have an exodus from downtown more Mm -hmm. than we already have. Yeah. And I think that part of the risk of sort of discussing these things through the eyes of a campaign is that it can feel like an either or type of conversation of like, we need to be investing in social housing and like, no, we need to be Getting uh, developers back into, you know, building up the city core. And the reality is probably like all of these things need to happen and that they need to happen like in concert and simultaneously rather than like one of them being the true path through for like the city of Portland. Yeah, it's it's interesting. And this is like one of I think this is my least favorite phrase that local elected officials use when talking about any issue because it just seems like such a cop out to me. But I actually think it's kind of true in this scenario is both and right, like both slash and which drives me nuts when Mm -hmm. I hear local (laughs) officials say that. Well, because we're a local official, that's a way for them to sort of wiggle out of taking a position. Exactly. Right. They don't take a position. (laughs) But I think when it comes to building affordable housing, yes, everything has to happen in concert. It kind of has to be symbiotic. I think we will make some progress, but whether or not we're going to hit our marks, big TBD on that. Yeah. Well, let's move on to mayoral candidates. Um, We've seen the polling. There's a couple people that are leading this race. You've picked out two people that have been outspoken on housing. Let's start with Carmen Rubio. What's she saying? Yeah, so um, I think the two candidates, why I picked them out, it's really seen as a pretty tight race between Rubio and Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. Um, What I will say about Rubio is she has, uh, I think a lot of onlookers would say, both people who plan to vote for her and people who don't plan to vote for her would acknowledge that she has done a lot on housing. Mm -hmm. For a number Mm -hmm. of years, she oversaw the Portland Housing Bureau. 
and um, really pushed through over the past two years various packages of incentives to make it more attractive for developers to, to build housing in Portland. That has included various tax breaks for certain parts of the city. Mm-hmm. That has included waiving system development charges. That has um, included kind of tweaks to uh, whether or not a developer has to make seismic upgrades. I mean, there she's just she's kind of tweaked a lot around the edges. She also just passed a 35 point housing production strategy for the city. Mm-hmm. I would say there's probably like all 35 of those points are not necessarily strategies themselves. I mean, I think officials like to say there are 35 points when maybe there's only like seven points that are prudent, mm-hmm. but she passed a housing production strategy. So she has actually done a lot as far as um, at least making small, you know, creating small incentives for developers. Yeah. Well, what's, what was your take on point 27? <laughs> thought it was really interesting. <laughs> I'm not I, asking you to have yeah. that level of recall. Like, I think I got to point <laughs> that would be... 12. No. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, like, it, it is clear that, she, you know, she is somebody who's thought a lot about this, who cares a lot about this, and wants it to be a part of her platform. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Rene Gonzalez, uh, I mean, he agrees that we need more housing of, of all income levels. But what I would say about his kind of view on it, his bird's eye view, is that it's sort of this top-down idea of, he likes to say, if we fix Portland, if we make it less lawless, if we if we crack down on public drug use, if we get people off the streets and we put them in shelters, if we make the city more attractive, more clean, uh, less crazy, like we will bring in that money and people will want to come here and build housing. So his is a kind of a simplified, a very simplified idea of how... It's the, the field of dreams policy, right? Yes, that's that's a great way to put it. Or in, in reverse, I guess. If yeah. you clean it, <laughs> yeah. they will build. Right, right, right. He's basically saying if we fix this one thing, because he's really making homelessness and public safety like the, the focus of his campaign. He's saying if we fix that, the housing will come up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and it would make sense that it might just be an issue that he has a lot less to say about because it's not central to his pitch. And I think that there's things in his pitch that we know sort of what his platform is, and maybe this just isn't a central issue for him. I think that is part of it. And I, and I also think, right, it's not part of his pitch. I think housing, sometimes when you get into the nitty gritty of how to build housing, it's really boring, I think, to to the average <laughs> person. I mean, I still get bored sometimes. It's slow and expensive. And it's slow and systems expensive. Systems development charges, everybody. Right, yeah. all, all this jargon. So I think people's eyes just kind of glaze over when you talk about kind of these small tweaks that Rubio is doing. And I think Renee is, uh, you know, say what you will about his, his politics, but like he's a good campaigner and he focuses on the bigger picture. And we know politicians get elected on promises. Mm-hmm. They don't always get elected based on like the nitty gritty of their plans. And so I think that's also part of the reason why he's not really focusing on like the uh, kind of the details of how he wants to create this affordable housing. What I will also say is that Carmen Rubio, one, she's been on the city council for for almost four years now. Gonzalez is newer to the city council, and he's never overseen the Housing Bureau or Prosper Portland, which is the city's economic development arm. Rubio has really been in it. I mean, she mm-hmm. she has led these bureaus that this is their mission Mm -hmm. is to build more housing and gonzalez just doesn't have that like inter-bureau experience yeah because like you said it gets really complicated really quick and uh carbon rubio has has been there she's read those 200 page documents yes she's read all 35 points of (laughs) oh i'm sure she she could probably name point number 27 (laughs) (laughs) well um Thanks for walking through all this with us, Sophie. This is is really fascinating. And I, I think that it can be sort of tricky to figure out how to, to talk about some of these things. And uh, I feel like I have a slightly better understanding about it than I did a half an hour ago. Good. Yeah, it's it's always a pleasure. It's This is like such a big topic. And I think we could probably talk for hours about this. And um, I think it's going to be one of the base issues in the upcoming election. So thanks for having me. And now it's time for some events that are happening this week. Every Thursday on the show, we like to bring you a handful of recommendations to help you plan out your weekend. Here's what we got this week. Pika's renowned time-based art festival is back, and it's bigger than ever. The Forward Thinking Arts Festival gets underway today, and it spans across the next three weekends, Thursday through Sunday. 
You can check out everything from performances to exhibitions and lectures. And of course, there's going to be after-hours dance parties, too. Grab yourself a weekend pass and explore. Animal lovers should mark their calendars for this Saturday's 12th annual Catio Tour. That's the self-guided tour of 10 of the most impressive cat patios around Portland and Vancouver. Registration for this year's tour ends at midnight, though, so you better get on it. And for all my weirdos out there, the inaugural Portland Weird Fest is also happening on Saturday at Oaks Park. Organizers call it a day of unapologetic oddities, offbeat entertainment, and a celebration of Portland's uniquely quirky culture. There's going to be performances, music, workshops, and I'm sure there will be costumes. Oh my gosh, the costumes. You know, if you love hearing about local events, we've got a brand new perk for CityCast and Hey Portland members you might be interested in. Every Monday, we're emailing a full week's roundup of all of Portland's most fun and intriguing events to members only. They've been handpicked by the team here at CityCast and Hey Portland. It's our latest member-exclusive perk, along with things like ad-free listening to the podcast. You can join our growing member community by heading over to membership. CityCast.fm. In the meantime, though, you can find the links for everything that I've mentioned and much more on our website, portland.citycast.fm slash events. We'll also throw a link to that in our show notes. That's all for us today here on CityCast Portland, but thank you so much for listening. If you've enjoyed the show, tell a friend about it or leave us a rating or a review. We're going to be back tomorrow with much more from around the city. Until then, we'll see you at Slim's. Slim's.